wherever you're joining us from. This is our Tuesday live stream, and we are joined uh, by our partners over at Avero Consulting or Avero Advisors. And we're excited to talk about our topic today that is public versus private sector and digital transformation. Definitely some exciting nuances and our, our experts and guests today, our um, experts are, they're experts in the, the specifically the public sector. Um, so just a few logistics before we get started. As always, we can see your comments, questions. Um, we always love hearing from our audience. Um, as we go through here. So if you do have questions, please go ahead and pop them in the chat wherever you are joining us from today. Um, just to test that feature, we'd love to hear from our global audience. If you could just pop in where you're located and where you're joining us from today, um, we'd love to know that. So with that, let's jump into this very exciting conversation. I'm personally very excited for it because I think Eric has met um, his digital twin if you will, um, in the market. <laughs> so I'm definitely excited to hear from Avero and the AV team too. So with that, um, we're going to have Megan help us facilitate on the public side, and um, we will do more of the private side questions and, and dig into the difference with those from Eric. So although most of you already know Eric, um, we will have him do just a quick introduction and maybe talk a little bit about more of the, the private sector, although we do at third stage do some in the public sector as well. Um, but kind of talk about your overall experience with that, Eric, and, and do just a quick intro and then we'll pass it to Megan and AV. Sure. So um, thanks for hosting this, first of all. And uh, my name is Eric yeah. Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage. Um, we're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world with their digital transformation journeys, uh, both in the public and private sector, but mainly the private sector. Most of our clients are, are public or uh, private sector related clients, manufacturing, um, construction, financial services, uh, professional services, et cetera. Um, I've been doing this for about 25 years in the ERP and digital transformation space. So really look forward to chatting through the nuances of what the differences and similarities are in some of the private sector work that we've done as well as some of the more public sector work that AV has done. Awesome, excellent. Well, um, excited always to have Eric on. Um, but with that, I, I'd love to hear from um, the Avero team. Megan, pass it over to you and, and you guys can do some introductions, kind of tell us where you work in the digital transformation space. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all for having us on today. I'm Megan Seaton. I'm the business development manager for Avero. Part of my job is to brand build and share the story. So this is a great opportunity for us to do so. Um, at Avero, uh, we help carve the path to modernization um, for local cities and counties. So we focus more in the public sector space. Um, and today, obviously, I have our founder and CEO, A.V. And A.V., if you want to do your own introduction, I'll turn it over to you. Great job introducing me. I, I, feel, like a, I feel like a star on the show. Um, you are. You are a star. Yeah, no. No, that's okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, my name is Abhijit Barakar. I just go by, by A.V. Uh, and I'm uh, six years ago to focus on uh, digital transformation and ERP. And the public sector into the 21st century. So when we do IT strategic planning or transformations, uh, we are bringing our clients uh, from the 1970s, 80s, still have mm -hmm. green screens and AS400s and extremely broken process at the time, 30, 20 years ago, were cutting edge, but uh, our, our clients tend to be built. Uh, we saw a niche in that industry and, and our focus has been anything to do with public sector, cities, counties, states, uh, uh, utilities, school systems, uh, these public housing agencies, anything government, we, we help them modernize business practices through uh, business process redesign, mapping, and when logical uh, enhancements. Yeah, absolutely. And I know we're we're coming in and out a little bit, um, and sometimes that happens with the the live stream, um, AV. So sometimes we can pop you back out and pop you back in because we definitely want to hear everything that you're saying um, in that piece. And and it sounds like just building on on what those those ideas are that there are quite a bit of different nuances when it comes to a public versus private digital transformation. So let's um, let's dive into that. 
Um, so let's start with with you, Eric, um, while we kind of work on the AV audio um, situation. How's this? What are some... Yeah, so we, we can hear you a little bit better now. So okay. let's talk about what are some reasons in which a public versus private digital transformation takes place. It sounds like in the public sector, there might be a... a a very large urgency or um, a need to be able to do that a little bit different than needing something in the private sector, like a competitive advantage or um, an organizational need. So Eric, let's, um, <laughs> Kassan, um, let's start with you on that and, um, and kind of talk about the differences that you've seen throughout your career and the, and those two uh, different categories. Yeah, so I think the the biggest thing that you know, if I start sort of start with the private sector and then turn over to AV for the the public sector priorities, you know, in the private sector, it's it's usually profit driven, efficiency driven, competitive advantage driven. Um, I think there are, you know, in terms of the business value that organizations get in the private sector, I suspect that's quite a bit different. And in my impression is that's quite a bit different. Um, I think there's some similarities though too, for sure. Like um, AV mentioned that. You know, a lot of his modernization work that he does at Avero is focused on organizations that are still, you know, stuck in the 70s or 80s using mainframe, green screen sorts of systems. Um, I think that's somewhat true in the private sector as well. You get just really outdated systems in the private sector at times. And then other times it's just more, you know, they're on a 10 or 20 year old system. So I think um, my impression is that the private sector might be a little bit ahead of the public sector in terms of technological maturity and where they're starting from. Um, but I to see what you think, Gaby, in terms of where, where the public sector is different in that regard. Yeah. Can you hear me? Is, is this okay, Kyler? Good? Yeah, you're still coming in a, a little bit choppy, but I think we're we're getting what, what you're saying. Let's go for okay. it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, think, I think the trigger the trigger is no profit motive for our clients, and there is a, a uh, always to be more efficient, be, be more transparent, be more uh, with the time. The funding doesn't exist uh, a lot of times or because, because no one's asked for the funding. Sometimes there, there's a you know negative inertia, so to speak, like your you're, things are working at a very basic level, so why, why change? So the, the trigger points tend to be there's a new mayor in town, there's a new administration, Trader, there's a new school director who been elected. They've ran on this platform of becoming more efficient and becoming more transparent. They come in and and uh, sort of trigger point a, a a change process. So it it's not always profit, and and, and they'll talk about saving money and, and being more answers, but but that that also doesn't tend to be the high, highest motivator. It's it more more often than external. Uh, change, change that's mandated that uh, that some regulations telling them to things break and there's a cyber attack or that they're, they're just they're back to doing stuff on them but really there there is no profit motive in our client mm -hmm. that's that's interesting in in that piece of it um and understanding that a lot of organizational pieces that you just mentioned av are 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 big factors as well thinking about um, new public administrators or, or those types of things. So let's talk about um, that a little bit and kind of dig into that. And I know, Megan, you have some questions too, so I promise as the audience knows I, I won't do all the talking. But when we look at things like organizational change and how those fit specifically, we know that that's huge on our side, number one reason of failure when it comes to digital transformation. How is that different on the public side. Um, so let's let's go directly to you, AV. Is that a huge factor that, that you need to be aware of when it comes to um, organizational design or, or organizational factors when you're talking about bureaucracy and constituents and those different factors? Uh, the points of failure tend to be on the organizational side. It's, it's, uh, lack of Preparation, lack of an understanding of what you're looking for from the, it's easy to just dismiss this as buying new computers or servers or getting a new system. But I'm sure this is a commonality between the public 
in private sectors where uh, if you have a digital transformation process through and what the outcomes need to be and how your organizational what's required, um, then then that can really cause a, a failure. More, more often than not, this organization, it's not paying attention to how important project management uh, it is to set a global vision um, for for what the, this project. That's that's really interesting. And, and Eric, if you can build on that, um, that would be helpful. And I know we're still having some audio problems, so thank you for letting us know in the comments. We'll continue um, to kind of troubleshoot that in a live, very non-stressful environment. So, um, <laughs> so just hang out with us for a little bit as usual. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and pop those in there. I'm going to get to some of what Basan's saying about kind of innovation and digital transformation here in a second. But I, I want to give Eric a, a chance to kind of um, talk to what that looks like from a, a public and private, just in your experience as well. Yeah, so I think there's, you know, you have, um, you know, internal organizational dynamics. I totally agree with AV that that's, I think, a universal problem or opportunity for both public and private sector uh, transformations. Mm -hmm. But I think in the, um, you know, in the private sector, you have, I guess, just different political drivers. It's more, you know, I feel like in the private sector, the political drivers internally that could undermine a, potentially a transformation is going to be, you know, people jockeying for, you know, position or authority or, or jockeying for, um, you know, moving up the organization and, and generally speaking, the larger larger the organization, the more politics you're going to have you know, and the more complicated it gets in terms of those internal dynamics. So um, I'm not sure if the drivers or the causes of those internal politics and those internal organizational issues are different in the public sector, but certainly in the private sector, that's something that, you know, a more established, larger, more mature organization is generally going to have just more complexity in terms of the internal dynamics, the internal politics, the resistance to change, the highly tenured workforce, all that stuff. So there's probably, I would imagine, just more variety, I guess you'd say, in terms of what sorts of dynamics you see uh, in the private sector, just because there's so many yeah. different sizes of organizations and that sort of thing. But be curious to see what you think, A.V. Yeah, and, and is is this better? Yeah, Sorry, actually, it is. <laughs> it is? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, uh, the driver point of difference in, in the drivers and um, what tends to sort of pull the boat forward is uh, is IT, right? The CIOs um, tend to be interested in change in the private sector, I think. Uh, in our case, the CIOs are interested in, in keeping things uh, conservative, uh, more secure, and then is that if you don't change, then you're then you're more secure. Uh, if you don't change, then things, we're working at a very basic baseline and we don't want to shake the boat too much. Uh, the CIOs don't uh, tend to be, even if they are forward thinking, they don't want to take the rating a political storm by wanting to change systems uh, frequently or in introducing change. Um, but I think from talking to you, Eric, it, it seems like uh, you guys market to have a, a solid partner in the, the IT organization where uh, uh, in is. Um, we're dealing with the elected officials and top management that will tell the CIOs in the IT organization what needs to happen. Hmm. Do you feel like, I'm just curious, Avi, do, do you feel like in the yeah. public sector that people feel more secure in their jobs and their tenure to the point where they, they, you know, they can do things that might undermine a project and it's not going to have the same consequences as if you're at a private sector organization or, what are your thoughts on that? It's really hard to, to you hear me. It's really hard to fire somebody in the public sector. You know, they might the the worst consequence they might get is they get or they get put on leave. But uh, that's also a, a, it's not things right and, and do things as well the first time. So uh, the the more progressions that can easily be fired so right uh, there's always that right but but then it also things better if they have a professional team like ours come in just just take on and manage the vendor man manage 
Yeah. Sorry, I think we're we're lagging here, Av, which is why we're all staring at you awkwardly when you stop talking. Um, but if yeah, if you want to try and, I, yeah, no worries. That's why we have um, our IT support team working behind the scenes. I'm just kidding. There is no IT support team. We wish we had one of those. But okay. um, let's turn to our audience real quick. Um, we always have a global audience, and just a reminder: what happens with this live stream? Um, is it goes into our Ground Control podcast, which is our longer form podcast, which um, streams and is available new episodes every Wednesday. So this will be in the following um, Wednesday's episode. Um, and AB and Eric actually did a video shoot as well at the Avero offices in Tennessee here in the States. So we will be including those um, with some other stakeholders as well in that episode. So um, be sure to subscribe to our Ground Control podcast and uh, you can, you know, be notified when that happens. Um, so I, I want to turn to the audience real quick. And, and Megan, again, I'd love to get your feedback on on this, too. So let's talk about where we have our, our audience joining us from today. So we have Mexico, um, Ryan from Denver, Colorado. We have um, James in the UK, Malcolm in the UK. Um, we have... Um, I'm terrible with names, so I'm so sorry if I, I butcher, butcher it, but it's um, Luzui from Cape Town as well um, and Germany. So um, we have a lot of different global audiences here. So I want to pull up real quick um, as my dog is um, Gassan's question here, and maybe, um, Megan, you can take this for me from a vendor's perspective and talk about kind of innovation when it comes to product fun functionality. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I'm going to turn that one over to AV. I know he's very choppy, um, but I think this is is a niche of his, and I'm going to let him answer that if you don't care. Can you? I want to make sure you guys can hear me. Okay, am I am I audible? Yeah, you're good. Yep. Oh, right now, loud and clear. Awesome. awesome. Sorry. And and yes, we don't have IT support this morning. Right before the live stream, our systems went down. So yes. apologies. This is uh, this is a great case uh, for uh, the topic we're on. Um, yeah. So from a vendor's perspective, when a software vendor is listed and stock exchange innovation is hindered, case in point, uh, Epicor many years ago. Yeah. So we, I don't, I'm not sure about Epicor, but we have we have other uh, publicly traded mm -hmm. software vendors that, uh, you know, the pressure for them is to. Uh, make the stock price go up. The pressure is to have uh, solid financials every quarter. And I think what we've seen is they have lagged behind in terms of customer uh, service and the quality of the product. And you can easily blame that on being a publicly traded company, but I don't know if that's a generalization we can make. There's just one company that I can think of that that I won't name, obviously, that um, that we've seen falter really bad uh, because they're their focus has been on acquisitions and growth through acquisitions and growth through acquiring new clients. Um, and unfortunately, we we see that a lot, right? We we do a lot of RFP uh, reviews for our clients because we're independent. We're third party, just like uh, third stage. Uh, and our clients are government sector clients. So they have to release RFPs when they need to uh, uh, buy a new product. They can't just mm -hmm. go and buy something. So we are looking at proposals. There's a there's a county up in New York. Uh, we recently helped through the RFP process. Ten different proposals came in, and the largest of these vendors, who's very prominent in the public sector, their proposal had some other clients' names in it, right? And it didn't even pertain to what this client was asking about. They just like copied and pasted it. And for a publicly traded company, that's a very bad look. Um, and and it's indicative of how badly that one vendor is treating their clients. Um, so yeah, it's not always uh, great that they're publicly traded because we've seen that that is isn't always an advantage. Yes, and on on that same topic, I feel like uh, um, here most recently we've seen not to bash any vendors, right? Um, but timelines, right? They come in and they say we want to implement this software in six months, and it's like what? Can you speak on that a little bit, A.V., maybe provide some examples on timelines and why that's a bad idea? Yeah, and I think I think that's a commonality, too, between our, our practice mm -hmm. and, and third stages where uh, the vendor community is, especially in ours, they're counting on our clients to not push back and ask the questions. They're counting on our clients mm -hmm. being um, sort of 
less educated in the whole process of uh, digital transformations and ERP implementations. So they'll throw things out to see what sticks. Uh, for example, a good example is how much to, you know, how, how long is it going to take to implement a um, tax collection system? And a very common answer is, oh, yeah, we can do it in six months without asking the follow-up questions of, you know, what the nuances of your operations are, how many agencies are involved. The salespeople are incentivized to uh, get the signature on the dotted line and then they disappear and leave it leave it to the project management team to solve, who then come in and say, yeah, that's that's not possible and what was sold to you isn't what we typically do. So there's a huge disconnect. And I, I don't know, what are you seeing similar things on your side, Eric? Yeah, yeah, I, we are, and it's it's that timeline's a big deal, you know, as far as um, being realistic about. It. I think in today's today's agile environment and in today, you know, focus on speed and and just um, you know trying to counter because I think what what happens in the industry is the, the ERP and digital transformation space has a is notorious for t projects taking too long, costing too much money, being failures, all that stuff. So the industry just the industry has responded by saying, okay, well, let's, let's do things that are more agile. Let's take an agile approach. So they'll mm -hmm. come in and say, Hey, we can do this in six months. We could roll out the technology in six months. We'll take this agile approach. We'll do sprints, all that stuff. And not that there's anything wrong with agile, but what it does, it creates a false impression or a false expectation that just by being agile and by leveraging agile concepts, now we're going to be able to deploy, we're going to be able to go through our transformation faster. But the problem is, is not the technology deployment that slows down a transformation. It's all the stuff that you were talking about, Evie, the yeah. organizational stuff, the operational stuff. And Agile doesn't really fix that. If anything, Agile in some ways undermines that need to focus on improving processes and defining your future state and all that stuff. So yeah. uh, I think that's a common challenge, I think, I would think across both both uh, public and private se sector. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, it, it, what we're seeing on our side is they're not even calling it Agile. It's just a way for them to uh, push the risk on the client and and get sign offs on things that don't make sense. Um, and when we are in the mix and we get called in to review the plans and shepherd a client through an implementation process, um, we're called hostile because we're asking very basic questions of the vendor's project management team. Where is the project plan? Uh, how do you expect us to go live on a randomly picked day? Um, and, and that's when the, you can tell that they're used to treating the clients uh, in a certain way. And when a professional team is involved, uh, like ours or yours, when we start asking questions, that makes our vendor friends really uncomfortable. So I wish they would use terms like agile to at least put a put a veneer of we've thought this through uh, right. before they put stuff out there, but they don't. It sounds like they yeah. do on your side. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they do. I think that it's such a buzzy word, you know, to say, look, we're yeah. going to take an agile approach and people think, oh, okay, agile, that sounds good. So you're going to solve the problem of projects taking right. too long and being complicated yeah. and all that stuff. Right, right. Absolutely. And, and speaking of agile, a lot of times and those timelines and dedicating overall commitment to those, there's a lot of risk there, right? There's a lot of risk associated with transformation failure. So I want Megan and Navy, and we'll go to you, Eric, um, after. If you can kind of take us through what are some specific risks that are maybe more prevalent in the private sector or that you've seen with your project work? So uh, the most prevalent is, is uh, a political risk, right? We are, uh, depending on who we're working with, let's say we're working with a, with a county in rural Tennessee, um, you have to convince, I don't know, 20 plus county commissioners in a small county that a certain transformation effort is necessary. Now, go back to our initial thought on who is our uh, main point of contact, right? You, you can convince the CIO, you convince the CFO, you convince the mayor, and now they have to present this to this legislative body and you have to get buy-in from them. And that buy-in isn't constant because they're elected for four years and some of these projects mm -hmm. take four to six years mm -hmm. and now you have your support system that gets elected out of the office and is your project still going to be a go that's like a macro risk but uh, at a project level it really tends to be uh, the speed at which we can move right and in the in the private sector again you have uh, profit motives you have to meet your goals for production your inventory controls need to be tightened up there's a real dollar amount that can be assigned to not having this project complete on time. On our side, it's more um, 
esoteric it's more political it's it's who's what are we going to be in the news what is the press going to say about this who's going to vote for me if i uh if if i have this public failure so a lot of times mm -hmm. failures uh tend to be glossed over and you sort of have um a longer uh, rope so to speak for failed project which isn't necessarily good right because you can yeah. you can uh, just stick with bad processes bad systems just because you don't want to look bad um so th those are some common common themes and in, in risks that we see yeah that perception yeah. obviously is on a heightened level so what about you eric what what are some risks that you feel like are a little bit different in the, the public versus private sector well i think it's super interesting to hear the you yeah. know the what what av just said because that's uh, <laughs> fascinating that it you know taking the safer route sometimes might be you know, the, the temptation in the public sector, because, yeah. you know, you're not risking as much, you don't risk of having a failure. Um, although, you know, like in the United States, we had just, I think it was last week, the FAA, mm -hmm. the Federal Aviation, what does the other A stand for? Uh, I forgot. What FAA Authority? Stands. Agency? Yeah. Authority. Yeah. 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 Leave it to the private sector, go. leave it to the public sector mm -hmm. folks here to help, help me out on this. But, <laughs> but the FAA in the United States, which regu regulates air traffic in the United States, um, they had a system outage, you know, and yep. Southwest Airlines in the United States had a system outage, although that's not a public mm -hmm. sector. Um, I think it's a good reminder that there's risk to not modernizing your systems and mm -hmm. leaving things the way they are. It may seem like it's lower risk on the surface, yeah. but there's, you know, I think we're seeing in recent weeks, a couple of case studies in the in the public sector and, and transportation related industry yeah. where, uh, what those risks are. Um, and I think that's true in the in the private sector too. I, but I would say that you know I, the private sector is probably a little bit more likely to have made some more incremental upgrades over the years. They're probably a little bit further ahead than the public sector. So in some ways, it makes it. I don't want to say it makes it easier, but the the more incremental improvements that have happened over the years, presumably, if if we if I'm correct, that they happen more often in the public sector, generally speaking, then the the transformations aren't as big of a leap for them. Whereas you know, if you're in the public sector or any organization that's using, say, a mainframe based system from the 70s, jumping from that to like a full cloud based SaaS solution, ERP sort of solution, um, that's just a big jump. And so there's more organizational risk and more pain that goes along yeah. with that. So um, I don't yeah. want to say it's easier in the, bio, in the private sector, but I, in some ways, maybe it is. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe. Yeah. The, you know, the, our clients, if it, they, they don't change very often. So they have the advantage perceivably of, of leapfrogging bad technology, right? A lot of our clients, like the, our local, our hometown client here is, um, we took them from an AS400 to a cloud-based ERP system over two, two and a half years. But for that to happen, they had to overhaul their uh, ISPs. They had to overhaul the their network environment. They had to overhaul internal processes for backups and security. Uh, you can't just go because it, it wasn't just an isolated ERP that was old. Everything was old and mm -hmm. they hadn't changed at all. So the the advantage of that was they could leapfrog um, bad ERP practices. Like, you know, 12, 15 years ago, you would have built something from scratch, an army of engineers in their uh, data centers building it for you. They could go from an AS400 to cloud-based SaaS ERP system. Um, because that that's what they could um, uh, afford in terms of uh, monetary value and business processes. Uh, their IT staff had been around since again the 1970s um, and hadn't kept up with the time. So and they were retiring. So it wasn't just the system that was being changed. Uh, it was the entire organization and way they thought about technology uh, that that was being changed. So leapfrogging bad technologies is an advantage, but at the same time. They couldn't. They hadn't done anything incremental, so they had to really like burn everything to the ground and start over. Um, but yeah, we have some clients that that have done certain things. They've kept up to the speed with uh, security systems and emails and things, but a majority of the systems are still uh, at least in the 1990s. Hmm. I love the question that just came through the chat because I think this is a huge topic when we're talking mm -hmm. about end user training. And in people's jobs, you know, they feel like uh, their jobs are on the line, right? When we go through this digital transformation. So the question is, how often do you find during testing or implementation that the skills gap is bigger than initially thought? And 
employees need to be repositioned within the company or replaced. So whoever wants to take that question, I think it's probably that, very yeah. similar in both. And I think it's it's similar and different. I think and, and I'm gonna take a stab at Eric's world. You know, it's it's um I think when you have a newer system that's bringing more automation and inefficiencies, private sector clients may lay off and reduce headcount because it's cost saving, it's direct impact on the bottom line. In our world, um, we've seen clients become more efficient in the sense that a, a, a really smart accountant who was doing data entry and triplicating and, and copying and pasting things into three different spreadsheets can now become more of a report um, analytics, uh, forward-thinking strategic person. So we've seen those shifts happen where a client or a small city has been able to really take advantage of the, the staffing that they have uh, to make things more strategically important. And then if people are retiring that had that were th their only purpose for not retiring was that they were the only people that knew, like the sun said, RPG three, that one person knows how to use it on an AS 400 and they are not allowed to retire because who is going to work it? We can't find people that can do that skill set. Um, but the, the real positives that come out of a digital transformation process that goes all the way from, you know, just modernizing networks and becoming more secure to a new ERP system, we the most impactful ones are where they can now take advantage of the smart individuals and workers that have previously been just, you know, doing copying and pasting and super clerical work. What are you seeing, Eric? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a super interesting question because yeah. um, I think maybe to back up even more, I agree with everything you just said, A.V. I think the big, big challenge, though, that organizations have is that they don't think through that question, you know, to yeah. define for themselves, what are we going to do? With, what are we going to do with A.V.'s job and Eric's job and Megan and Tyler? You know, how are their jobs going to look different? What are their roles and responsibilities going to be? I think too often we, we give lip service or we see organizations give lip service to potential benefits and call it good and say, for example, you know, AV, um, guess what? We're going to roll out this new technology and it's going to automate 30% of your job that, you know, instead of having to manually go look for information now and, or manually process a PO or whatever the case may be, now you've got software or technology that can automate that. And, mm -hmm. you know, usually people position that benefit or that value as a, as a positive to, to employees, but oftentimes that's going to get perceived more often than not as a negative because yeah. you haven't told me what am I going to do with that other 30% now? You're telling me you're going to automate it, but what are you going to do? Are you going to cut my pay? Are you going to cut my hours? Are you going to cut my job? Um, are you going to assign me other stuff that I have to learn and you haven't told me what it is yet and so I'm scared? So it's mm -hmm. all those sorts of things that go through people's minds because they haven't defined where, what the skills are they have today, what the skills are they need for the future, and then they don't have a deliberate planned transition. So it doesn't, it doesn't directly answer the question of, you know, what we typically see or if it's uh, the skills gap being bigger than initially thought. I think, mm -hmm. I guess I would agree that, yes, the skills gap is bigger than most organizations think. But more importantly, they don't even define what what the gap is and how they're going to get there. I think that's the even more important question is how, how are you going to how are you going to close that gap, whether it's big or yeah. small or whatever? Yeah, we, we also see we also see that uh, there's a lack of understanding of what automation will mean. Right. Mm -hmm. If if you were uh, running paper based processes in, in our world, it's purchase orders, right? You need a pencil, you need a process for purchase order, uh, three different approvals. And I'm exaggerating. But um, when when you go into uh, government offices, organizations and say, we're going to redesign your process where we map it, right? We use IBM Blueworks Live and we'll map a process uh, with every decision box, every resourcing uh, box, every action box, and a 20, um, 20 step process turns into a five step process. And a lot of our clients don't understand. So if I'm not doing that copying of that spreadsheet and pasting it into this spreadsheet, who's doing it? Are you telling me that I'm not going to be doing that so I'm out of a job? Um, it's, it's a process of educating them on what a modern system does. So a lot of times what we'll do is before they even put an RFP out, we'll do like a market scan and educational demo with a vendor that is non-committal uh, from the client side to say, here's what a modern 2023 ERP system does and how automated this is. Um, and it just blows their minds because they, they haven't looked up from their uh, green screen or their Excel sheet in, in 20 years. Mm. Yeah, that's that's 
um, you know, super interested in that fact. And, and I think it goes back to something that is a fundamental difference or another misunderstanding, specifically when it comes to the public sector, digital transformation overall projects. You had meant before, A.V., that sometimes vendors kind of create a copy and paste approach that mm -hmm. in the um, those kind of canned types of timelines, those canned templates, we hate the word templates, we never say it. Um, but when it comes to understanding specifically public sector businesses, are they all the same? Can you use that approach knowing that the same city and county of San Diego might be doing something that the city and county of Albany might be doing. Can you talk mm -hmm. to us about that misconception? It's, um, I, I would say it's it's 80, 90% similar. Uh, it, it's a city, like you, a city or a county exists to provide services to your citizens, right? Uh, collect taxes, make sure the roads are okay. You have, you have sheriffs or police officers that can communicate with each other. And then on the internal side, they need to make sure that you know, the dollars they're spending are being recorded correctly, that there's audit controls and there's proper reporting. That's the basic uh, function of a, of a public sector agency is to provide services to the to their citizens. And uh, what tends to happen is, uh, you know, if they don't have a long term strategy, that's when that's when you get these siloed systems and processes um, that don't necessarily connect to each other. And that's where they sort sort of lose the the mission. And again, if you don't have a global vision of where you want to take your organization, uh, which is which is again a commonality, right? You, when you deal with your clients, the basic simple thing: why are you trying to do this, and why are you trying to modernize your systems, um, and why a specific tool set versus versus another. Absolutely. And and what do you think about that, Eric? And, and we see that a lot kind of when it comes across industry, right? If you've worked in food and beverage, then you know everything about food and beverage. Yeah, I guess the is this is an interesting thread that I hadn't I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about, but what it what it's maybe opening up to me a little bit here is that, you know, in the private sector, I suppose it's quite a bit different. There's a lot more variation, I would think, because, you know, whereas a city or local state federal entity has sort of its defined scope of what service mm -hmm. it needs or should be providing to its its stakeholders and constituents. Uh, yeah. Private sector is different in that there's no clearly defined scope. I mean, you, your strategy is constantly evolving. You're constantly trying to outdo the competition. You're trying to keep up with the industry and, and macroeconomic trends, all this, all these different things that just influence maybe the private sector a bit more. And there's just more of an open road, I suppose you could say, as far as how they go about running their business. Whereas in the public sector, it's sort of not predefined, but you know, you have a narrow scope. You, there's certain things that you just have to do. And Navy just did a good job describing yeah. some of them. Um, so I think that probably creates less of a case or a less likelihood that you're going to have best practices or templates that could work off the shelf out of the box for any given mm -hmm. scenario in the private sector. Um, but I would think it's even challenging in the public sector, though, even though even though what you're saying, it'd be is, you know, I think you said 80 to 90 percent of yeah. processes are similar. And yeah, there's nuances and, you know, slight variations. But in those cases, um, are you seeing that you could still use in many cases like pre configurations or industry best practices or just sort of vanilla software? Do you think it's more likely that you can use that in the public sector than than in the private sector? I think so. And, and you know, we're I think my team's doing a great job of educating our clients on on that because it's easy for for a city, even like, you know, the the city we are headquartered in, the next door is a smaller city. And how different can two small cities in Tennessee be? But you talk to them and they're like, we're so unique. So <laughs> New York and San Diego, the people that are operating these cities, they uh, it, it's a lot of pride, right? It's city pride, mm -hmm. civic pride. So they don't want to be like San Diego. The Nashville does not want to be like New York. Um, so there's that plays into it a lot. But as consultants, our job is to tell them, yeah, all of that aside, you need to run your payables process. How different is it, right? And uh, we're seeing that getting get get a little better uh, with time because in in uh, the vendors take advantage of this too. Uh, here in Tennessee, we have one vendor that's legacy. Uh, that sort of somehow has the blessing from the state uh, and and everyone assumes that that is a state provided system and therefore must be better 
than anything else out there. Uh, we've got a similar situation in, in Virginia uh, where they have a system that most cities use that isn't very good. Uh, but the perception is that because we have Virginia cities, this is the one to use. So a lot of it is perception. And I think the more we educate our clients and the more we um, help them understand that at, at a very basic level, uh, the blueprints exist. Now, your state or county uh, or comptroller's office may have certain restrictions and regulations on how things are classified or how things are reported back on. Uh, those nuances need to be configured for, but for the most part, um, and again, public sector is large. There's different kinds of agencies, right? If we're just talking small city to small city, the majority of the processes tend to remain the same. Mm. Absolutely. And and I think, um, and I, I know, uh, Megan, you, you definitely uh, know about this question um, as well. And when it, in the overall public trust. So kind of moving back to that hot topic, which is the FAA, what we'll go over in, in ground control next week, the entire kind of failure. Um, Gosan says that cybersecurity threats and data breaches in the public sector really determine public trust, which is ultimately the need to be able to secure funding, right, for these bigger projects. So what's your reaction to that, um, AV, when it comes to big failures that could be, you know, that could determine the overall voting of your constituents, I would assume? Yeah. Well, and, and loss of data is, is pretty real, right? We, we see a, a, a lot of cities and counties, they, uh, they get hacked. Uh, data is held for ransomware, and and in most cases, it's older systems that have never been tested for backups, that have never been, they've just paid for things that, um, and we see this every day, you, they'll buy things that they're not uh, implementing 100%, not all the features are turned on, um, they just don't have the infrastructure to uh, escape a, a cyber event in, a, in an efficient manner. So uh, that sort of taints the whole thing. So when you start talking about hosted solutions and software as a service um, and, and the cloud, the immediate reaction is how secure is it? Um, and then we have to dig into how secure they are currently, because if, if the baseline's not there, no amount of um, cloud security and SIMs and network monitoring is going to help you. Right, so in the it's it's prevalent in the in the public sector. They're getting better at it, but also they're going at it from a from a cyber insurance sort of uh, standpoint, which is they're assuming they're going to get uh, a cyber event, and now they're looking to uh, shore that up through a cyber policy, which also opens another whole can of worms because uh, cyber insurance providers will cover you. They may not pay for your claim because you don't have all of the uh, your ducks in a row and you haven't checked off everything that is not just technical, but from a management perspective, you don't have um, uh, you know, proper disaster recovery plans, incident response plans. You don't know who's in charge or who to call when a cyber event happens. Um, so there's layer, I call it a, the cybersecurity layer cake. If you have one layer, is it still a cake? But you really need seven layers to make it real. Um, so cybersecurity is, is something that's critical in, uh, in our clientele. Yeah, and I think just to build off of what AV has said, um, sometimes, not all of the time, we do see a big disconnect between our executive leadership and our IT departments, right? Our executive leadership, sometimes they don't know what questions to ask um, or how to communicate. Hey, are, are we cyber secure? Are, are we secure? You know, and so I think helping them bridge that gap within the organization is key. Absolutely, 100%. And love the food analogies. Definitely keep those coming because those are my personal. But in, in knowing that, and we have a, a lot of dialogue in the comments. So thank yeah. you for um, continuing to do that. Just so so you know, we will go back through and answer all of those um, too if we don't get to your questions. And you're very right. Nashville and New York City are very culturally different. I think that's a big key takeaway is, is each um, city and county can be, each organization has its own subculture that's going to determine the overall success of that. So I want to go to Eric a little bit just to, to touch on the importance of that cybersecurity and that overall understanding of, of what those gaps in system 
systems. We see a lot, and I'm not sure if you do AD, AV um, and Megan, but it, we see a lot of best of breed solutions. So a lot of those interoperabilities within an organization and the need to kind of close those doors to cybersecurity threats. So want Eric to be able to you know comment on on what you're seeing as far as uh, those needs in our our digital transformation projects. Yeah, I think cybersecurity is a big deal, you know, in both both spaces. I think that's another commonality or area of commonality. I think the risk is a bit different and the the visibility might be different. I'm not sure, you know, who the bigger targets are, you know, whether the bigger targets are in the public or private sector. I don't have a good answer for you there. But but I I think that in many ways, you know, the the, the private sector has more to lose in some ways just because I mean anyone's gonna lose, obviously, if they have a cybersecurity issue or incident. But I, I would think that in the private sector, especially larger financial services companies or even retail or, uh, or any organization that has consumer information, credit cards, things like that, um, there's just more at stake, I guess you'd say. Um, and I suppose that's probably true in the public sector, too. I might be oversimplifying or maybe I'm um, painting, painting a bigger contrast than, I, than there really is. But I think that's what private sector companies have to worry about is just the risk of you know, if they have a breach, it's a big deal from a customer mm -hmm. perspective, a customer trust perspective, it could affect their profitability. And so back to the earlier question of what drives digital transformation and business value in public versus private sector, private sector has a lot of profit to lose if they violate yeah. that trust in public sector. It's maybe a different kind of a, a trust that's lost or different a negative business value that's realized yeah. from from a cybersecurity breach. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and they hold the same kind of information, right? If you're if you're collecting taxes or you're collecting uh, money for your uh, car tags or utility bills, especially huge risk factor um, there to have that data exposed. Um, mm -hmm. So when we do digital transformation, it's also a great time to see who's holding what kind of data, right? The the best practice, and or at least what we profess is that as you're bringing in new systems, uh, be very careful and sure of who's holding your data. If you're in the cloud, if you're running through a third-party payment system, who's going to hold ultimately the banking information, the the people's credit cards and and social security numbers? And the the smarter clients are pushing that risk off of uh, them to uh, to the vendors, and the smarter vendors are saying, "Yeah, we'll carry it for you for an extra price." So it's it's all in the design and again rethinking how you're how you're delivering services and what parts of this service should you be responsible for? Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And, and if you missed it, we did talk to um, Brad Feeks a few weeks back when it comes to overall um, cloud security. So you can head over to our ground control podcast or our YouTube channel, be able to see that as well. One other thing I'll mention just on the, the public sector, do you have some additional content for our global audience? Um, as well, when it's to additional um, transportation, we we talked about British Airways last week on ground control. Um, if you do have any examples of how globally you've seen um, public sector businesses uh, go through a digital transformation, we'd love to hear about it in the comments. So kind of keep that coming. Um, I I have a, a a question when it comes to public sector. What essentially would be your metrics for success? What is your ROI when it comes to achieving a successful digital transformation? It, like you said, it's not really profit driven, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to hear kind of what your clients, what are they trying to achieve mostly? Yeah. And how do you help them kind of hone into that and, and achieve that alignment around it? Yeah, so great question. ROI is hard, hard to define um, for our clients because, you know, you're not going to suddenly collect more taxes because you have you might you might pick up on the ones that haven't paid in a long time and and uh, therefore collect more um but it really depends on how they define it and they usually don't so it goes back to why are we doing this what's the trigger event and it can be as simple as the old thing broke and now we're back on or more more transparent more automated um and if they ask us to, we'll define it for them. There's a lot of assumptions that get built into it, right? What does, what would uh, it, how much time did it cost you um, to create a purchase order in the past? And now how much time does it cost you uh, with the new system? So for example, a client of ours uh, that was using an AS400 green screen uh, for their ERP, it would take them a week 
to two weeks to just go from I want to buy a box of pencils to the department director saying yes and sign offs and they would send pieces of paper through inter-office mail to the other buildings so that someone else could sign it. And that process went down to about one hour, assuming everyone's at their desks or on their phones and paying attention. So how how good is that for ROI, right? So we were able to you know, assign some dollar amounts to that and just, you don't have to be a whiz to, to understand that there is a return right there. So in our clientele, it tends to be stories like that. It tends to be um, assumptions on how much time it took to run a certain process in the past versus now. And it's really immeasurable, right? Because they're, again, very well-meaning, smart people that have been bogged down by a, a lack of modern technology. And they didn't know how to start thinking about this. Um, and to see them uh, do things in a more automated fashion after we've gone through this whole process of digital transformation is very satisfying to me. And I think that to to us is internal ROI for Avero. Um, but also on our client side, it, it's it's a great story to tell when that person that was just running around with paperwork has now uh, got time to like sit back and become more strategic and um, and think about the future rather than just chasing Excel sheets all day. Yeah, that's really well said, Eric. I don't know how you're going to follow that. Yeah, but, no. yeah, that was. I've got nothing. You know, if you... <laughs> you, you you need a points counter. You know, I need I need I know. to know how many points. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah that, I'm I'm here for points. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and I, I think, you know, that's something that certainly translates in in our world for doing both pub- public and private sector work. Um, so, Eric, how do you help a company define the measure for success when you're sitting down, you're talking about project strategy and you're making sure that you have that alignment and commitment? Um, how do you help businesses really kind of pull that and define it? Well, I think in some ways it's it's easier for the private sector for a lot of the reasons that Evie just mentioned. I mean, there's there's not a, and we talked about this earlier too. There's not a, a traditional ROI calculation that you might do in the public sector, or at least it's going to be harder to do because how do you, you know, you can quantify a lot of what Evie just said. It's difficult, but you could quantify, you know, the efficiency gains and what do you gain from having someone you know streamline their process. How do you what do you gain from um, employee morale being higher potentially because they've got better tools. Mm-hmm. They're not frustrated, you know, trying to fight an uphill battle against their technology. And someone in the, uh, somewhere in the comments here, someone mentioned that staff turnover is a good measure. That was one of the comments from, from LinkedIn here. And I think that's, that's something you could point to and say, you know, that's, that's a positive ROI. If we can decrease attrition and employee satisfaction is higher, there's some value there. And the private sector though, I think it's even, it's even more important because in the private sector, in my opinion, you have no excuse not to figure out what the ROI is because it, you yeah. are profit driven. You are driven by cash flow, and that's your, you know, as an organization, that's generally the top, you know, the top priority. Whereas public sector is a little, little bit more complex. Their their goal is not to maximize profit. That's just not what they do. And so, private sector, if you can't calculate an ROI or you don't focus on ROI, I'd say you're not doing your job. I think you need mm-hmm. to be looking at what the ROI is. Yes, there's certain business value business drivers that are harder to quantify than others. Some you can't quantify, but if your only reason for going through a transformation is because you have to, because you have to replace your technology and because SAP or Oracle or Microsoft or whoever told you, you have to get off an old legacy system. That's not a good enough reason. That might be the reason you're doing it. That might yeah. be the impetus, but you still have to define where the expected business value is not just to justify the project, but just to give you sort of that guiding North star of how you're going to manage the project. And what is it we're trying to accomplish with this transformation beyond just replacing technology. So I think ROI is super important in the, in the uh, private sector for sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, well, I know we have just a few minutes left um, with the team here. So just want to get to a few additional questions. And just a reminder, if you put your questions in the comments, we always go back and answer all of the questions. Um, so, uh, so I want to get to this one because this is really interesting. I'm so sorry. I can't see your name. It just says LinkedIn user. Um, but specific public sector, almost all organizations have a risk management division or department, yet more often than not, they're not involved in transformation efforts. The whole concept of, quote, compliant by design is completely foreign to them. I know when risk, risk management is involved, it reduces costs of poor quality, thus reworking the design. 
Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on this specifically, and maybe even digging into the factor of compliance, right? That, that I assume that's a, a big thing in your world as it is in the private sector. Um, but I wonder if you could kind of elaborate on that. So let's, let's go to AV first on that. Sure. Um, yeah, risk, risk management is, is an important function within our clients. They, you know, when we when we do our contracting, it's such a long process. And, and this one, Eric can get a point on because our contracting, um, our contracting takes a long time. But risk management uh, is involved because they want to make sure we have the right uh, insurances and things like that. So so that the county or the city is compliant on projects, uh, they tend to be not involved as much. But you're right, they should be, because uh, when you're selecting a vendor, uh, that's that's cloud based. How do you make sure that they're compliant with your uh, organizational practices, with your expectations for cybersecurity and risk management? And um, they tend to reduce uh, the risk of bad quality for sure. But in my experience, in in our clientele, they are very focused on just the insurance and bonding requirements, and they haven't evolved to the point where they're asking the real critical questions of a software vendors from a risk management perspective, but I think it's getting there slowly. Eric? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, risk management is more important with um, publicly traded and, and larger uh, private sector enterprises, I would say. Um, and so that's a, that's a big um, risk management's a big deal for them, partly because there's compliance issues, but also partly because they just have more at stake and they're usually more, um, sophisticated and mature in their ability to manage risk. But I think there's a lot of lessons that, you know, the mid market and even smaller uh, private sector organizations could learn from the public sector and from larger private sector enterprises in terms of risk management. And uh, back to the ROI question, you know, one of the equations of ROI is obviously cost. And if you can mitigate cost and risk during your deployment and after your, your transformation, um, that's certainly going to deliver an ROI in terms of lower cost and it, uh, reducing that risk of having the, the project plan and the budget get out of control. Yeah. And I, I just want to comment on, um, sorry, Kyler, I didn't mean to oh, cut no. you off, but I just want to comment a little bit on the um, RFP solicitation. So part of my job is, is to look um, for RFPs uh, for a barrow to respond to. And I think just to make a, a brief comment, I think sometimes the, uh, they can be too compliant, right? And so our our public sector clients, they limit themselves uh, to what kind of business they can actually do because they haven't revamped that compliance process. So, good yeah, point. that's an excellent point. Really, really good point um, for sure. And, and we all know that the most expensive part of a digital transformation is the RES. Right? We took that from yeah. um, Tim Creasy over at um, ProSci. That's redo, redesign, restructure. And that's a lot of times where we're coming into implementations that have failed or on the yellow path to fail. Um, so definitely so important to have that information solidified enough up front. Um, so as we kind of round out, I always like to ask Eric this question, AV. So I'm going to ask it to you and see if you answer the same to him. So no pressure whatsoever. If you're sitting in a room with a client, what that's getting ready to go through a digital transformation or are contemplating what that's going to look like for their, um, their public sector business. What is the number one piece of advice that you typically give to them in knowing that this is going to be a long, arduous process? What's the kind of the one thing that you would say, do this if nothing else? Um, make decisions. Like if I'm talking to the sponsor who tends to be, you know, on a financial ERP implementation, typically a CFO, Make decisions. Don't be afraid to make decisions because there will be times, um, especially with, with our government clients, which everyone is, right? They make decisions by committee. So if there was one thing I would say, be a strong man, at least for the, or woman for the, for the next um, year and a half so that we can get this thing going and moving along. Very good. Very good answer. What about you, Eric? Well, I think just, just building on that, I think, you know, the, um, the alignment, you know, not only making decisions, but then getting the team aligned, because I would think I would think in the public sector, you're less likely. And, and first of all, you're, you're unlikely, you're highly unlikely in any organization to get a unanimous agreement on major decisions that need to happen. Mm -hmm. But I would think in the public sector, perhaps 
I'd be curious to see what you think, A.V., but uh, I would think in the public sector, you're less, even less likely to get total alignment and total clarity of direction, partly because yeah. of, you know, elected officials, the the internal politics mm-hmm. and the things we talked about earlier, yeah. um, and, and partly because there isn't the clear uh, profit motive that most private se- or public sector, I'm sorry, private sector organizations have. So I think that um, that in some ways helps in terms of creating that alignment. But even in in the private sector, it is difficult. The the larger the organization is, is, and the more stakeholders you have, the more employees you have, the harder it is to get get everyone on the Mm -hmm. same page. I think that's really key, too, is just really sort of greasing the wheels with not only good, solid decision making, but also once those decisions are made, making sure that you've got clarity and direction and you're all you're all aligned, heading the same the same direction. Yeah. Yeah, Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I, was, I was just going to say one of the things I hear AV say all the time when we're in the room with a client is um, make sure you have a clear vision, right? What is it that you want as the executive leader or the leader of this project? What is it? What do you want out of it? And I think knowing that from the top down and communicating that to your employees is key as well. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. alignment alignment is key because, you know, th- there's also a perception in our world that the rank and file workers will outlast the elected officials and, the, and therefore the appointed directors. So there's incentive and really no repercussion in uh, slow rolling it. So setting the vision and making sure that, you know, because you can't fire people easily, you there is no profit motive. This is now a case study and how do you motivate people to do something really difficult that that doesn't impact their bottom, their personal bottom line um, immediately. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you motivate people in that, in that very easy answer, one sentence question, but it seems as though that's, um, that's a necessity, right? For this, this type of thing, it's going to be the only reason in which the project is going to be successful. So what are some tactics that specifically in thinking through as a public sector business, that you can do to create that motivation or that internal buy-in. I think that that's when we put on our therapist and Tony Robbins hats, right? And and uh, understand what motivates people and find those leaders at every level that will take this on for you, for a more esoteric reason um, that they want to, you know, being in public sector, they they're making a choice to, um, in many cases, make less money than they would on the outside. So there is that strong public service sentiment that we tap into and help people uh, align themselves with the project. Uh, If someone's about to retire and they've been like, why why are we doing this now? I'm leaving in two years. Could you not have waited? We can then roll this into their legacy as you know, before you retire, don't you want to leave this place in a better place? Uh, If it's a new employee that has just come into the workforce, this is your chance to make this place better. Do, Do you want to keep working on an AS400 for 30 years? No, but let's do this. So there's there's a lot of nuance and our, our team is pretty good at uh, the motivational part. Um, as consultants, this is probably a similarity. We, we are practitioners of um, a very specific craft, but also we have to be good therapists without being licensed for it and without um, you know being clinically good at it. We have to be therapists at a very basic level because this is hard. This is hard stuff. Absolutely. Is, that, um, and that and, understanding is yeah. so important too. that listening yeah. and understanding where people mm-hmm. are and where they're going and where the pains are. I think that's a great, great point. Well said. Yes, we we often um, refer to our change management practitioners as um, industrial psychologists, because that's really what they have to do. Right. Um, that's absolutely key. And what I'm hearing is that we're going to need to do a second session with Eric and A.V., and Megan um, about the importance of organizational change and overall industrial psychology in public versus private sector. So we we certainly we're all voting and we vote for a here. But so we so appreciate you joining us today and um, sharing your insights. So Megan, where can we learn more about Aveo or how can we get to know guys a little bit better? Yeah, absolutely. By following myself, uh, Megan Seaton or uh, AV on LinkedIn. We also have an Avero Advisors LinkedIn page. Um, please visit our website, averoadvisors.com. Um, we have links to our YouTube channel there. Um, a lot of great videos, a lot of great storytelling, client stories. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you again for, for joining us today. Um, and we will tag 
AV and Min and our partners here in um, the comments. So you're able to easily connect with them, uh, but definitely recommending, uh, recommend following their thought leadership um, and um, continued dialogue in this space. Uh, so as a reminder, this live stream will now be absorbed into our Transformation Ground Control podcast. We have two podcasts here at Third Stage. We have um, one that drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, our Digital Stratosphere short form podcast. And then we have our longer form podcast that covers industry trends and then features thought leaders like AV and Megan in our space. Um, so head over to our website. You can subscribe to those. We also live stream them on Wednesday mornings. So you can join me in team and chatting with us. We stream the podcast on wherever you get your podcast. Um, so thank you so much to um, Eric, AV, and Megan for joining us today. And we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. This was great. Yep. Thank you guys.